Great. Nice to see so many familiar names on the uh, on the screen. Every once in a while, I hope I get to see your faces. Just turn your camera on for a second for me, and it'd be great to s just get a quick wave. So it's 2.40, and we're going to go on to the next step in our process of providing uh, some uh, some thoughts and, and actually ranking those thoughts on how we can improve digital government in Canada. And it's probably good advice for the rest of the world too. Canada is a world leader in this space. So we're going to start with the first question. And we're just going to go through them in the same order. So we're going to continue to do our uh, Obu analysis, opportunities, barriers, <laughs> exploration, and wild ideas. And to present opportunities, we have uh, Catherine Waters. So uh, I'm just going to check that this is up. Yeah, so you see on your Slido screen right now, and when you if you're on Slido, you will get the chance to vote. You have in front of you a list of the uh, opportunities that were uh, in inputted by each of the groups, and we captured those that came up onto the chat as well. So thank you to everyone. Please go ahead and vote. We will. You have three answers, so choose carefully which are the top three that you think are the biggest opportunities for a digital government in Canada in the current environment. Uh, pick top three and we'll see what we uh, what we come up with. Go ahead and vote please. Great, we're getting lots of answers coming in. Please continue to vote. Still have a little bit of time, Peter. I think uh, just a few more seconds to let people vote. Yeah, I think we have the vote count in the top corner there. I think we need okay, well, to give them uh, yep. at least 30 seconds because that was a long list. It's a long <laughs> list and it's complex and they overlap. We're we're going to keep all of these for the, for the purposes of our research in the IOG. But just so you know, we get your group sense of the top three. So keep voting. We've got more participants. This is open to everybody, YouTube and uh, the Zoom participants. And what we'll do is we'll see what the group overall. So there's still opportunity to vote. You know how to get into Slido. Just go www.slido.com. And you, when it asks for your code, you put in hashtag digital directions. And it will send you straight in. You can also point your phone at the QR code on your screen. And you can point your phone, yeah. Or click in the link in the chat. So I will take a look at the chat as well and just make sure that everybody who wants to vote is voting. All right. Good. Well, thank you for that, folks. We've got some results and we'll go with what we've got for now, though you can. Um, we're still getting a few more coming in, so I'm going to just count to 10 in my head and then we'll close it down. Okay, let's go with what we thought. We've got a big number one. Um, still a couple more coming in. Thank you. Um, that 57% of respondents have chosen delivering services where people want to consume them. 
knowing that they are always people who will prefer. So great, that's a top one. And an important caveat also in there to say that we don't abandon those people who don't have the technology, are uh, afraid of the technology, or just prefer the one-on-one -on -one in person contact. So good point there, but also really valuable opportunity to use all these tools around. So 57% pick that one. We have 43%, the new normal that we have learned during COVID. So basically that point that's been made in a number of different, both as opportunities and, and in the wild idea sort of character uh, category to say that the new normal gives us access to uh, a speeded up version of what's possible. We've all adopted fast, learn fast, and build on that. So great um, opportunity there. And then we have a number of them that are closer together, but 29% of people said capture people's voices through access to different tools. And the person who offered that uh, opportunity or the group that offered that opportunity actually said, look at what we've done already today, how many tools we've used to capture different voices through different channels, through different ways that work for you. So what we've done is we've tried to coalesce everything into one place, but offering lots of ways in so that your voice is heard. So that's 29%. Uh, we have a number of others that have featured quite high, um, rapid hiring and recruitment, flexibility, access to diverse populations, but we have a clear not one, two, three there. So thank you very much for that vote. Perfect. Thank you, Catherine. And uh, now we're gonna look at barriers. And Gafar, I think you're going to introduce that poll. Yeah, so uh, as uh, Danke is uh, preparing it behind the scenes for us, uh, what, one thing that does come back again in this one is that, uh, you know, there were quite a lot of them uh, and there is quite a little bit of overlap between them too. So I think that it's going to be as interesting for people to go through the list uh, and then uh, sort them out and uh, choose their top picks. Uh, so, uh, Becky, let me know uh, how far we're along. There we go. So it is quite a long list, uh, Peter. Uh, I think we should give people uh, enough time to read through it. I'm going to stop talking so that they can focus. Uh, there is a little bit of overlap, so take the time you need. Uh, I think it should be a, a very interesting one for the barriers. Terrific. And for anybody who's joined very recently, the Slido link is in the chat. You can use the QR code on the screen, or you can type in join Slido and put in number digital directions to cast your vote. The greatest barriers to digital government in Canada. Hey, everyone. I've got to do something in the YouTube channel. So forgive the weird screen share for a second. I think we're going to have to move to the 10 second in your head countdown there, Gafar, so we can yes. get all three categories, all four categories in. <laughs> Absolutely.
So Peter, uh, what we're seeing here is uh, the internal culture in the public service, which is not surprising. There were in fact quite a, a few other items here that may uh, fall in that category as well. So I think if we actually lump them all up as uh, culture or culture in the public service, uh, that number would go even higher. Uh, so uh, that your, that's your first uh, element and it's a very interesting one. Uh, so something to keep in mind. Uh, the second one uh, has to do with the risk averse nature of government. And in fact, this is one of the items that could fall under the first one too, uh, that there is a culture of risk aversion, uh, but it could certainly be a, an item on its own. And the third uh, equal, uh, we have uh, regulation and red tape, uh, which once again could be uh, part of uh, internal culture, uh, as well as seen uh, equally uh, as uh, important of an obstacle or a barrier as having enough cycles to do the existing work at the same time as uh, mindfully designing and implementing user-centered uh, services. So this really speaks to uh, our capacity to uh, actually do all of this work. So these are our top uh, three uh, barriers, uh, internal culture, risk aversion, and then equally uh, regulation and red tape with having the bandwidth to carry out all this work. That's all for me. Thank you. Super. Thank you, Gafar. And uh, now we're going to do areas for further exploration. Catherine, Peter, quick comment. Could I, ask, could I ask a very quick question? Becky, can you just go back to the opportunities for one second, if that's possible, just so we can see that screen again? Just for two seconds. I just want to see the, the three. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, perfect. Thank you. That's all I needed. All right. So we're going to let Becky do another quick flip. And we're going to turn, turn it over to Shelby, who has captured areas for further exploration. Indeed, I have. Um, so the question exactly as you just said, was what area of digital governance is most critical for future exploration? I think every group gave really interesting answers and were really impressive. So I'm really excited to see what the top three end up being because I'm not sure. <laughs> and your choices are. So everybody's used to the drill now, right? Just cast your votes. So you're starting the uh, in your head count down there, Shelby? Yep. I'm just uh, looking at the vote count and giving people a little more time. I think the sentences were a bit lengthy and a lot to go through in just a matter of a couple of seconds. Um, yeah. Great suggestions. Right? <laughs> I think we really gave everybody a challenge in terms of picking just three, because I think all of them are really interesting and really important. Um, all right, I guess I think we have our top three. We'll start from the bottom, build a little bit of anticipation as we move to the top, even though everybody can see them. <laughs> so at number three, which is actually tied with number two, is how the 
Oh, things are moving. Okay. Okay. How the digital transition can enable direct democracy. Uh, at number two, which I'm really not surprised about, is further um, exploration into artificial intelligence. I feel as though for most of us who are not into a super techie realm, artificial intelligence is like this big mystery box that everybody just kind of wants to poke into. Um, but of course, obviously can be a very helpful tool. And then our number one are that um, 48 of our participants voted for, which is significant, um, is increasing public confidence in digital governance. So somebody gave the example of the COVID app and how some people did not want to download that because they thought that it would impede on their privacy. And I think um, increasing government communication in terms of how uh, digital governance is really important. Yeah, amazing answers. Super, there's your uh, work agenda for the next couple of years, Chelsea. <laughs> So uh, we'll move on to the next category, which I think uh, with great anticipation, everybody wants to know what the wild ideas are. So uh, Stephen, what do you got for us? Excellent, Peter. Well, uh, Canada was born to be wild and we have a lot of uh, different definitions of wild uh, according to the, uh, the suggestions that came forward and that is great. So I'm just gonna invite uh, Becky to put up the, uh, the diverse list of uh, wild ideas and see what uh, wild and disruptive notions uh, have come out of this uh, discussion. Of okay, there we go. So um, people are accustomed to uh, the format now, uh, now that we're at the uh, fourth time in, um, but there is a, a plethora of uh, suggestions here. So uh, similar to, to Shelby, I think it'll be really, uh, really interesting to see what comes out on top. So let's let's get in there. Let's uh, use your opportunity to vote um, and uh, use your uh, use your. You only have three options or three three choices. So spend them wisely. And as I say that, I need to remember to vote myself. Great activity. And as uh, has been said a numerous times um, by Catherine and by, uh, by Peter and others, um, this dialogue that's happening this afternoon is going to be so important to help us uh, focus our energies after this um, this event today to to uh, tease out some of these questions and, and build upon some of the uh, areas of inquiry. So thank you very much, um, Peter. I'm not sure if I'm as literate as Shelby on assessing the number of voters that have participated. We're good. We're at uh, 23, and you can report right. the result. Okay. So um, I'm just going to um, exercise uh, the prerogative of uh, leading this event to uh, to do a little bit of cherry picking. So the the top the top two embrace uh, the COVID-19 innovations. There's no going back. Um, I think uh, we Canadians are and uh, the participants today believe that uh, tremendous innovations had occurred in a short period of time, and we should just keep running. Uh, with those and let's not go back. Uh, the next is um, taking more of an, an interesting um, social uh, dimension to uh, this um, this opportunity and, and let's make sure that we're looking at uh, being more inclusive and so let's let's examine at the number two what what we can look at from a, a digital point of view or digital frame 
to make uh, to make our politic and our communities more inclusive as a result of digital tools and enabling abilities. Um, the one more interesting thing that I would like to draw people's attention to for a third one, um, just to uh, just to um, uh, maybe be a little bit provocative, is the one that's a little bit further down that says uh, be able to slice and dice organizations with new areas of focus when new areas of focus arise. So that, that item I, I just draw to people's attention because it correlates with some of the uh, other comments that have been made uh, with respect to the Westminster model uh, in some of the other pieces. And the question that I'm reformulating, um, um, admittedly, is uh, a lot of our departmental structures and machinery have been in place for a long, long time. And so the question is, do we have the machine right and um, from, a, from a digital point of view? And does uh, digital provide us the opportunity to re-examine re departmental mandates and, uh, and the way that we're structured uh, as being one of the uh, one of the provocative questions that uh, might be coming out of this? So thank you very much, Peter. I think this has been a great discussion. Yeah, super. Thank you, everybody, for uh, contributing to the ideas, for uh, helping to rank the ideas, and happily to have informed three out of our four panelists on uh, sort of the proceed the outcome of our afternoon because uh, we were joined by three out of four panelists uh, I'm we are expecting that uh, parliamentary secretary secretary uh, Greg Fergus will be able to join us but apparently they've scheduled two votes uh, for the afternoon <laughs> so <laughs> between votes he's gonna pop in and then uh, when he has to vote again he's gonna pop out and we'll see how that works but uh, Peter, we're looking good news actually his office called no votes he'll be here at 310 and he's all ours oh wonderful all right even better okay so uh the other thing i will just uh, highlight is we're posting the top three opportunities top three barriers top three areas for exploration and the top three uh, wild ideas into the chat. So if anybody wants to refer back to them while we're going along here, we can. So just a little bit of logistics on the panel. So uh, I just want to remind everybody that we will take some questions during the panel. So you can add your comments and questions directly in the Zoom, YouTube, Slack chats. We'll be moderating all those questions through our Slido page and we will use those to, uh, you know, inform the conversation as we go along this afternoon. Uh, of course, you can uh, vote things up and down in, the, uh, in there, and we'll be uh, looking forward to seeing what it is you're most interested in seeing. But I think we have a really good idea of what that is already from the exercise that we just completed. So I am just going to introduce uh, fairly quickly, actually, I'm not going to introduce fully our three panelists because we're very fortunate that uh, they have been able to join, join us and I'd like them to introduce themselves and share a little bit about why they're particularly interested in this topic. So we have uh, Anita Baines with IBM, former Chief Digital Officer for Innovation Science Economic Development. We have uh, Shingai Manjengwa, who is the CEO of Fireside Analytics, and also uh, along with Anita on the board of the IOG and just a tremendous contributor to the thinking in this area. And we have Amanda Clark from uh, Carleton University. So our academic contribution and when uh, Greg Fergus joins us, we'll have a political contribution. So perhaps in the order I just uh, presented, could you just take two minutes, give us a little bit more information about who you are, how you became interested in this topic, and uh, we'll uh, build on that as we go along. Uh, sure, Any Peter, thank you. I, I, I guess that, that's me first, and we'll pass it to uh, the rest of the panelists as well. I, I, I think that uh, it's such an interesting topic. We've been talking about it for a long time. Uh, I think that's also you know, interesting. It does take a long time to, to shift our thinking. And I hope a lot of our discussion today is about how we think about this, uh, both as citizens or, or Canadians or those who are here in Canada at the moment, uh, or politicians or public servants, and those like also in the private sector. So I did have the privilege of working in the, in the public service. Really interesting role to think about digital differently, uh, worked at uh, Innovation Science Economic Development. And then also I'm now at IBM as a partner 
thinking about how uh, the underpinning uh, innovation, digital tech sort of supports a public sector and by default supports um, back to what we do to support um, you know, the service we deliver to, to the public. So I can't wait to talk about it today. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Shingai Manjengwa, and uh, I'm joining you today because I believe everything digital is data. Um, I'm a data scientist by profession, and I come at this from the perspective that everything that we're doing on a computer, on a mobile device, is now data that can be harnessed um, to advance our civilization. Uh, nice, bold claim there. Uh, but in addition to that, we can also improve government services. And um, there are a number of things to be uh, concerned about and things to, to think about and to plan, including the skills. And I'll, I'll probably get into that uh, more in, uh, as we discuss. Um, but my roles, I am the founder and CEO of Fireside Analytics, and uh, we do data science education. So that's everything from literacy to more advanced programming, uh, data visualization, et cetera. And that's for a number of different audi audiences, everything from high school to policymakers uh, to private sector, et cetera. And then the other way that I, other hat that I wear is I am the director of professional development at the Vector Institute for Artificial Intelligence and pretty much similar type of work. But in this instance, I am building educational programming for artificial intelligence. So everything from literacy all the way to advanced algorithms, to understanding algorithmic bias, uh, to all the, the great work that's coming out of the research there. So looking forward to a great conversation and uh, let's chat about everything digital is data. Hi, everyone. Really, really happy to be here. Thanks for organizing this event to the IOG. Um, I'm an associate professor at the School of Public Policy and Administration at Carleton University here in Ottawa. Uh, and I come to this topic um, very much uh, from, from a researcher's perspective, um, probably, for, I guess, about the last 10 years, I've been researching digital government reforms. And uh, I think I think it's sort of the most important topic to jump into when it comes to thinking about improving our um, governance processes uh, for today's challenges. And um, I also focus on this area because I, I think it's very underserved by the uh, public policy and public management community who have kind of traditionally marginalized IT and tech as something that is sort of distinct and separate or maybe a nice add on to the real business of government. But I think what we're increasingly seeing is that digital capacity is at the core of kind of government policy capacity more generally. And, and that's why I chose I choose to focus on this in my work. Thank you all. And uh, we appreciate your enthusiasm and the variety of perspectives that we have. So it'll be terrific to get into this conversation. And uh, I was really delighted that you could all get here in time to kind of see the results of the last session. So can you perhaps pick up on what you heard in the Let's let's start with opportunities and barriers, perhaps that blend of opportunities and barriers, and just uh, share any uh, reactions or things you think we might have missed, things that uh, you just want to jump on and reinforce <laughs> any of those categories. So uh, should we go in the same order? Yeah, Anita? sure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Peter. There's so much to talk about, but I, I think that, uh, you know, we've got some leadership here on public policy, on data, and there's many that are listening uh, and all have the area of expertise. I think the topic of policy is really important uh, and is a bit of a chicken and egg, right, dilemma around whether we really figure out what additional policies the federal public sector need to bring into uh, the dialogue and work on or do we start doing digital transformation? And, and, I, and I think that, uh, that that's actually a barrier to, to us making some really significant leapfrog decisions on transforming uh, how we serve, which is essentially what we're trying to do right now. And so we're always worried about the typical stuff, right? Oh my goodness, what's the policy issues on cyber? What's the policy issues on data sharing, you know, residency? Uh, you know, can you use AI? Is it ethical? We've got expertise here. You know, what, what, um, you know, worrying about all of these, these issues, policy sometimes needs to be driven by pushing on trying, by actually beginning to experiment. And I think that could be a very interesting dialogue. I was 
you know, watching some of the Slido uh, results and you always hear culture and, you know, barriers and legislation. Well, frankly, sometimes you can't just sit around a room, even with public consultation and decide, you need to go through the experience. And we don't have enough collective experience inside the public uh, you know, sector to say, we know how to do this. Therefore, we need to start trying. And so I wouldn't mind having a little bit of a debate on, is it policy first or is it transformation first? Super, sounds like a great place for uh, Feng Jai and Amanda to pick up. <laughs> yeah, that's a great place to start. And I always use the analogy of, imagine if something like uh, Google Maps or Apple Maps had to have come from government. Can you imagine the risk team? Um, and you know, if it told you to turn left and there was a cliff there, right? That product would never have been launched out of public service. Um, but we all agree on the utility and we can't remember when we used to use physical maps to get around. So I 100% agree with you that um, th there has to be some balance between that innovation and the policy. And um, one of the suggestions was, uh, I think, a Dragon's Den style, uh, you know, using open source. Uh, let's get people in who know what they're doing, who've done it, who maybe have prototypes and, you know, government can leverage that. And that's definitely a, a great way to go. Um, on the subject of uh, culture, unfortunately, all our best efforts will die unless we have people on board. So that's maybe where I'd say uh, my focus would be, which is, you know, we have to do that culture change. And yes, I'm from an education background, so I will say that education is the way to go. Um, my belief is that if more and more people, that's the policymakers and the end users, understand what the technologies are capable of, uh, what's real and what's not. There's a lot of fake news out there about you know, the technologies as well. Then I think that moves us forward in terms of the culture change. Right now, if you just have people speculating, I heard somebody believes there are nanobots in the vaccines that are gonna be tracking our every information. And my response to that was, so what is your phone for? So anyway, um, I think the, the moral of the story is we, we need to get on the same page and do some learning and literacy, both for policymakers and constituents. Would you like to pick up them, end? Sure. I mean, I think for sure the conversations that came up both in opportunities and risks, uh, sorry, barriers around, you know, addressing the, the risk culture in government um, and thinking about the extent to which there's space for experimentation and innovation. And I think there's been a lot of good work done, done in this space and, and there's kind of more to be done um, to recalibrate how public managers in particular think about um, how, you know, how to manage risk through prototyping and experimentation. Um, I think at a, at a bigger level, what I think about when I, when I think about the opportunities um, for, of this moment is, is I, I'd like to see us push back a little bit in, in our thinking in Canada about what our vision of a, of a, a resilient, democratically accountable digital government is, right? To raise the conversation a little bit beyond services that are tailored to users. I mean, we know like that's all pretty, that's all pretty acceptable. And I think the minister's remarks this morning reflected how far we've come. I mean, she said, as far as I'm concerned, all the right things about the approach we need to take and the vision. Um, but I don't want to say those are the easy things because it's certainly not going to be easy to build um, a government as a platform model to focus on raising digital literacy across the public service to build in, you know, single ID and, and all these important innovations that she mentioned. But um, we haven't, I, we haven't at a bigger level had a conversation about kind of what would, what do we, what, what is our objective in terms of social outcomes from digital government? And what I mean there is sort, sort of in terms of access and inclusion, um, how our data is used, the role that the private sector should or shouldn't play in these efforts. I mean, these conversations aren't, aren't really happening. And I think they're the harder conversations because they get into um, values, uh, they get into our role, our, vi our vision of what we think the public sector is for. Um, so it becomes political fairly quickly. And I also think there's a far too much corporate influence over these narratives. Um, a lot of the, the standard like like logic of, a, of a, a speech about digital government or a strategy about digital government is citizens really, really need fast, easy to use services. And if government doesn't deliver, then we're going to lose trust and government will fall behind. And so here, quick, jump on board with this technology. And if you don't, you're too risk averse. And also, don't worry, we covered the privacy angle. So you're good. And, and I read that and I think, 
that's quite a simplified version of what's going on here. And I think there are many technologies that governments should not be jumping on board with, that we should be taking our time with, that we should be we shouldn't be looking to the tech sector for models of how to interact with citizens or of what responsible data stewardship looks like. Um, and you only need to look at the kind of disgrace that most of our major tech firms are in today to say that an alternative vision of technology and its role in our life um, needs to be needs to emerge. And I think it should emerge through kind of democratic dialogue, through the political process, um, through open exchange of ideas across many populations in Canada and not through the management consultancy corporate tech firms who have been pushing a very narrow vision of tech which usually surprise surprise results in us buying their products um turn to an amazon website right now i can guarantee you that amazon web services is telling you that the solution to government's problems is cloud they will say that and it follows from most other tech firms when they when they frame what the solution is here and what the problem is Perfect. Well, so, uh, I, I mean, it's interesting to explore what the alternative narrative uh, might be. And uh, I guess that's the type of conversation we're trying to uh, provoke today. Uh, I think that I, I, I'm, I'm tempted to go to you, uh, Shingai, just to sort of say, you know, everything is in the cloud because some of it's data and analytics, right? But <laughs> I just wonder if you uh, have uh, an, an immediate reaction to some of the comments that uh, you heard from Amanda today. Yeah, so I think we also have to be careful about painting tech companies as a monolith that's out to get us or, you know, that has this agenda. Um, certainly there's some of that and uh, profits are a very, uh, they're a North Star that is, you know, um, many, many companies that is the primary focus. But I will say um, in interacting with these organizations that a lot of it is about problem solving. And even as an entrepreneur myself, um, I'll give you a stat. The courses that I've created online have over half a million people that have taken them. I can assure you when I started this company, I had no idea that I would have that level of success. If somebody now comes back to me and says, oh, Shingai, your videos didn't include, um, I don't know, uh, translation, right? So your videos your, in your courses didn't include translation. It's easy to, at T equals now, say, Shanghai was not inclusive. She didn't go out of her way to include people who speak different languages, etc. But in my mind, when I was developing the product, my objective was to solve the problem, which was education. And I think that's true for a lot of the tech companies. Twitter did not set out to be a policy platform for heads of state. Right? They were trying to be something else and that's what they became. So I think there, there are lessons to be learned and for sure you know, using uh, tech companies as our moral compass is dangerous, um, but there are also many benefits from, from understanding how they've been able to create community, to get feedback from users, um, and we can learn from that. So I'm just uh, welcome, Greg. I'm gonna go to you in just a minute and I gave everybody sort of two minutes to introduce themselves and talk about why they're passionate about this topic. And then you can perhaps pick up on the conversation around opportunities uh, and any particular barriers that you like might like to present. But uh, just to give you a minute to think about that, <laughs> we'll go to Anita and then uh, come to you. Thanks. Uh, thank you. I feel uh, like Mr. Ferguson should go first, but uh, certainly uh, uh, you know, uh, happy to just so quickly jump in for a minute. Clearly, you know, technology is sort of my bread and butter, even though I did work in the public service. Uh, you know, I, I actually think we wouldn't survive, uh, you know, working from home without it. So uh, it drives our economy. Uh, it drives every industry. Uh, it drives education. Uh, every every uh, you know role that we now have has some form of technology that uh, you know we can benefit from. Is it the be all end all? Absolutely not. Uh, however, we have to figure out what that circle of trust has to look like, and I put that in the chat. And, and I think it's really that dialogue, the circle of trust inside governments in all jurisdictions are still a topic, but also with small medium enterprise and and larger technology giants, it's easy to uh, place the finger in that direction because there are some pretty, uh, you know, difficult media and stories out there. But, but I think this is the dialogue. The dialogue is how do we get public opinion 
and opinion from industry. By the way, industry is public, uh, you know, from in terms of people who are who are working there. We are trying to solve our own problems for ourselves. We all live in this beautiful country in some capacity or the other. So I think we've got to sort that out and then figure out what that dialogue is. And, and you only do it by starting with a few very specific outcomes. Through COVID, we had no choice. And we were working through it. So back to big, very significant catalysts and big, big, big problems that we have to solve, uh, then require everyone to collaborate very quickly. So I would love to hear uh, from Mr. Fergus, um, please. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Anita, over to you. Uh, well, well, first of all, Anita, please call me Greg and everyone here. <laughs> please, please do. And Peter, he got, Peter got it right. He called me Greg. He knows that. He knows the routine. <laughs> um, look, uh, I, first of all, I'd like to apologize for being a little late. Question period ran late today. So uh, I had to uh, hold on uh, to the last minute. Um, but uh, once that was over, I came straight here. And it seems that I've landed really in, in a great debate. But before I uh, before I begin, let me just say that I'm coming to you from Elmer, Quebec, which is the unceded territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin people. So it's uh, I'm grateful to be here and to be joining you on this important debate. Look, I think I probably lean a little bit more to Anita and to Amanda. Oh, oh, sorry, Peter. Should I say a few words about myself? That would be uh, great. That's what you wanted, Look, Craig Ferguson, <laughs> well, member Parliament. And then, is... yeah. Okay. <laughs> Et puis, est-ce que je devrais faire ça en anglais, en français? C'est comment est-ce qu'on va faire ça? Si, euh... On fait surtout en anglais aujourd'hui. Okay. We're going to take questions and comments in French, but uh, the presentation language is primarily English today. All right. Well, well, look, folks. Uh, uh, member of Parliament since 2015, uh, parliamentary secretary to the Minister for Digital Government, clearly, uh, which is why I'm here today. But I'm also parliamentary secretary to the uh, President of the Treasury Board as well as to the Prime Minister, and in all of these things. Uh, I think the, the sort of le, le, le fil conducteur, you know, the, 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 the common thread to this is really looking about how can we truly uh, modernize government. Now that sounds, you know, vanilla, um, but what we have discovered in the last uh, year, which I think is just really amazing, is, is how when we had to, we adapted. Uh, and I think we we adapted mighty quick, mighty you know, rapidly. Yet, yet I think we still stayed uh, somewhat true to some of the values which which really undergird the public service and, and what we're trying to achieve. So it wasn't a free for all. So this is where I would say to Amanda, it's, it's, it's saying you know we didn't just you know take the Amazon Web Services approach to the world or the Google approach to the world and we just went with whomever. Uh, uh, we, we really tried to do this in a way that was respectful of, of, of our relationship with, with Canadians as citizens and making sure that we're providing them with uh, services that would be commensurate um, with what they get in so many different other options, right? Um, which, I thought was, uh, which, which I thought was really uh, important for us to do. Um, where I... You know, perhaps the biggest opportunity for us is uh, is really to continue with the creative aspect that we've lived through for the last 15 months. As hairy and as scary as that was, um, overnight transforming uh, a workforce to work from home, where we're all doing these Zoom conferences, uh, and I know we're tired of it, and it, it has some and that has some significant um, uh, consequences to that, um, you know, from the very serious about people who are caught in, in domestic violence situations, or the fact that we're being socially isolated, um, that we're just not having that you know, human to human contact, which is so important. But then there are the positive sides of things. And the positive sides is that we can be creative and we can deliver critical services uh, to Canadians um, um, in new and innovative ways. It's that type of creative um, approach to me, which is, I think, our greatest challenge. How do we keep that up? How do we uh, uh, be able to be, but, you know, we talk about being agile, um, where we can propose an, a, a service or an approach or a new way of operating internally, see if it works and if it doesn't very quickly change it about. That's what we haven't done 
in, in my 34 years in this in this in this region, um, you know, this is what we need to do more of. And um, if we can be that agile, that responsive, that iterative, uh, I think this is this is you know this is a whole new world that can open up to us. And then that necessarily leads uh, to uh, to what we do in the digital services that we provide. And um, you know we we were we were listening to people in ways that we didn't listen to. Uh, especially younger public servants, um, uh, where we, you know, really were open. It was it was all people around a virtual table figuring out, you know, how do we make sure that we can deliver um, these income support services that, that Canadians needed in a global pandemic when they had to stay home. Um, how do we make sure that we continue delivering uh, services that Canadians reply, uh, uh, depend upon, rely upon us uh, to provide? Um, how do we make sure that we offer uh, new ways of, 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 of having, trying to break down the silos and the barriers that we have from department to department for sure, and even sometimes within departments, depending from program to program that exists. To me, uh, these are the things which, um, uh, these are the opportunities which are in front of us. These are the opportunities that we really have to seize. Um, and we can't let the opportunity pass and just go back to the way things were in 2019. The world's moved on uh, and we need to not only move on with the world, but I think this is a great opportunity for, for government uh, to, to match up or perhaps even leapfrog um, uh, some of the interesting things which are happening outside of government in the digital space. Super, thank you. Uh, for introducing yourself and sharing those uh, initial thoughts. So uh, we've, uh, you have uh, provoked a pretty good conversation going on in the uh, Slido, and I'm just going to pick up uh, one of the questions. I think it uh, it's not exactly uh, opportunities and barriers, but I think thinking about it will help us understand that. And th the comment is, in, in a democracy, those in power are elected, not in big tech. Yet the big tech products can destabilize society. How do we reconcile power with moral responsibility? And I think we've actually started that conversation already, but more explicitly with that question in mind, uh, perhaps one of them. Uh, you'd like to go, Amanda? Sure. I mean, I think it's a great question. And I do think it cuts to the heart of, of the matter because I think increasingly as digital is the core of of not only the the kind of government citizen interface because that's where we're, we're where governments are meeting citizens um but also in terms of um, the data that's collected how it's used i think digital and data infrastructure and government define the art of the possible sort of what can be done what's possible so and also the the holders of knowledge about those digital and data systems end up having a lot of power in in a system of governance when when the digital and data systems are so core to operations of government so all that to say if governments aren't holding the reins and rather it's um either private firms who've been procured in uh to develop or deliver services for government or whether it's the case of private platforms that who have their own reality outside of government activity happen to be the, the spaces where citizens are getting information or engaging in informing communities here i'm thinking of like conversations around vaccines on twitter for example um i think this is what i mean when i say it's not to it's not an anti-industry statement it's more that i i'm a pro-democracy person and i think that yes in these spaces i want my government to have the upper hand and i think we've let that slip a little bit um i'm definitely not calling here for government to regulate twitter although i'm sure <laughs> i'm sure we can have that discussion because that's definitely happening or it, it, there are discussions about that but i mean more let's talk concretely how this could manifest so one would be to um do exactly what shingai uh, recommended and what the minister recommended earlier which is focus deeply on literacy and education in the ranks of the public service. To what extent do our 
senior leaders, especially in government, um, and not just in the CIO class or the IT departments, but in your policy shops, do they really understand digital and data and the systems they rely on? Can they be effective and intelligent procurers of these systems? Can they ask the tough questions of vendors? And can they identify where there are genuinely good opportunities to collaborate with industry and spaces where government might want to develop um, or build in-house? Um, how do they understand the implications of the data they're collecting and the harms that it could cause um, or the benefits that could accrue? These sorts of things, this is not in the average toolkit of today's public service, in part because of programs like mine who have been producing graduates of policy degrees, our, our policy degree for decades. And I can tell you that only until very recently did we provide any of this sort of content. So we certainly have a role to play as universities and organizations like Shingai's are doing, I think, sort of very important work on the ground to, to, to build that capacity. So the education piece is a great way to redistribute power back to government in the current environment. Um, and then the other piece is, I think, to take a very hard look at our procurement and how procurement is structured in government, um, the extent to which that's accountable and open. There's a lot of under the radar lobbying and influencing that's happening from tech vendors and it's not an open space. There's very little room for the um, SMEs to compete. I know there's efforts to resolve this, but I think we can go further and that's what I'd like to see because as soon as we create a more pluralistic market for, um, for buying technology and we are prioritizing things like open source and we're ensuring that government maintains ownership and stewardship of the data that are collected through these procured systems, again, we start to redistribute the power back from tech firms and into the hands of accountable officials so that ultimately when systems fail, MPs like Mr. Fergus or Greg, sorry, can can speak before the house and genuinely under, like genuinely be the owner of that. Whereas if you're in a system in which it's kind of been outsourced and we don't know much about what's going on, it is it is reasonable that Greg would be. <laughs> it's hard to be accountable for that, right? And I think we have to um, put the accountability back into the hands of government actors, and that would be a really big way of distributing, of redistributing power to the democratic channels that we have our faith in as citizens, right? Terrific. So, uh, yeah, I've seen hand waving, I've seen, seen hands go up, but let's go, let's go in the order that they pop. We'll go uh, Anita and then Greg and Sheng, I'm going to give you a slightly different question, okay? I'm sure you have great thoughts on this one, but just yeah. to keep it moving, okay? I, I think it's a really, it's very provocative, Amanda, what you're saying, it in, and it's a good debate. Right, and that's what that's what these healthy dialogues are for. Uh, I would say it's not a distribution of power issue; it's actually a trust issue. And you said it, education, uh, as well as policy, right? So as we learn, uh, is it good to have cloud or not, private or public? You know, does it make sense? Well, we can go really, really slow and never go to cloud and spend another 100 years trying to figure out how to distribute our services to communities that are have no access to the internet and how we're gonna sort that out and then eventually get them to the cloud and eventually get a true democratic society where everyone has access to information. But you gotta you got build some policy around that. And you only build policy around that if you do have healthy debates. You don't have to go all in in one direction or the other, you have to build a circle of trust and not every leader in tech firms um, are profit thinking. And frankly, there has to be profitability uh, you know, in order to drive this economy. So it's a, it's a circle of trust uh, and, and it's gotta be to solve one big outcome or one big problem at a time. And as we do that, we find a new way of working together so that we all win. And we find a new way to go digital, which is essentially what we're trying to figure out. And we just don't have enough collective uh, sharing of information, insights, and trust around around these conversations, which can then drive um, some policy outcomes. So, my two cents. Thank you. So we're going to pass to uh, Greg, but can I just uh, I'm going to prompt you to comment on that. But there was a question that came up that I think relates back to your earlier comments. But as the secretary to the president of the Treasury Board, uh, how can you influence sort of agility uh, from that 
Treasury Board perspective, I think it's perceived to not be the source of agility in government in the way the way I'm reading the question. <laughs> Oh, Peter, I, I'll, I, I'm going to strike fear in the hearts of all the officials who are uh, listening to make my minders to make sure I say the right thing. Uh, but um, I, I would agree with you. Uh, we don't. Uh, we have set up a very hierarchical system, um, which uh, you know it, 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 it impedes uh, that kind of agility. And, and it, it, re it requires, you know, ex external events such as a pan global pandemic uh, that forced us all to really uh, flatten that uh, that approach and really try to distribute the responsibilities much wider to those who actually have creative ideas. Which brings me to the point which I think uh, Amanda and, and Anita brought up really uh, solid perspectives. I'm going to just give it. A, I'm going to give it. A, I'm going to try to give it a different angle uh, that, than what they have. I think the approach that government has to bring and an approach which I think people would like private corporations to adopt more of is a citizen-based approach, right? Uh, government is made up of people and through the dignity of your ex mere existence, you are a member of our society, of our of our country, and you have an equal right uh, to participate, to influence, to change, to do whatever. To I mean, you, I, I hate when people talk about citizens as taxpayers or as shareholders. We are individuals, uh, citizens, human beings who have this, you know, right to exist. And I think that's the approach a government will always take in dealing with. Uh, things that such as the innovations which are happening in the digital space now the the problem is is that uh, you know data uh, uh, growth harvesting uh, and and uh, and the whole informatics type of approach uh, and analysis approach that has grown has done so sort of in an extra legal environment because government just didn't adapt quickly enough um, but I think when we have these events like a pandemic and, and it forces us to really confront with these issues to figure out how do we keep ourselves relevant uh, because people are voting with their feet and are, are, are you know, accessing different services uh, that the private sector has done and perhaps government looks stale uh, compared to it, that's when we need a new approach such as what the Minister for Digital Government is, is, is proposing. But it, it, it's focused... She would say it's focused on the user, I, you know, or focus on the client. I, I like to say it's focused on the citizen, um, and uh, I think that's the approach that we need to take. And he does right. There are some private companies who are not as motivated by money as they are by uh, providing an innovative service, um, and it's great they can make money on the side. Making money is, is a good thing in a, in a capitalist system, um, but there has to be it has to be within the context of a society. And I think government is, is sort of uh, has, has, is aware of that. And I think the services in the, in, the, in the digital space that we'll be providing will be very much at the center of that whole concern will be the citizen. Super, thank you. Uh, Shengai, this question actually does allow you to respond or build on what's already been said because there have been several mentions of how important education and learning are in this context. Uh, but the way the question came through is, uh, and of course, everybody's welcome to comment, is that uh, youth and children are relentlessly targeted through monetization models on platforms. Uh, what, and I would expand that, I don't think it's just youth and children, we all are. Uh, so what suggestions do you have for engaging I guess youth and children initially and the rest of us more broadly in critical thinking and relevant learning? That is a great question. And um, I agree with uh, a focus on the youth because they are inheriting some incredible problems from our generation and uh, preceding generations as well. Um, so uh, there was an announcement uh, this week about um, changes to the mathematics curriculum. 
Um, and I think steps like that are helpful uh, because they start to fo uh, focus more on the emerging technologies. Uh, one of the analogies I always give is we do a very good job in our current education systems of uh, getting learners to appreciate the world around them, you know, gravity, et cetera. But many of us who use this every day don't know how an email gets from our computer to another place. And so our digital world is not well understood. And that needs to be embedded in the curriculum. It shouldn't be a summer camp coding thing. Um, it really needs to be, the digital world is as much a part of your life as your physical school and the physical world that you live in. So an emphasis on this topic within the public education system, I believe is imperative. I've been talking about it for years. Um, we're seeing those changes happen slowly um, and perhaps we'll get there. But if we hope to, and I, again, another great example is what is our, who is our prime minister going to be in the next 20 to 30 years? What degree will they have? Will that matter? Um, will, it, will it be enough to have a political science degree? Um, or will we insist on some kind of engineering or computer science background just by virtue of the, the, the country that they need to govern? Right, so really starting to look ahead at these things are affecting us. And you know, just to touch on Amanda's point about um, the power uh, uh, dynamics that we're experiencing right now. Um, if you are leading a country um, and a country, uh, sorry, a, a tech provider can reach over your border and influence your election, um, then it's time for, as a leader of a country, to make a change, right? There needs to be some intervention and let's call it regulation because that's what it is, um, in order to address that. Uh, if you think of the world that you live in as a, um, an expansion of your home, as a parent, if your child was being unduly influenced, um, perhaps it's for the purpose of buying something or even just in terms of ideas, if you were unhappy with where those influences were coming from, you would need to take a stand and you would have the authority to do that as a parent. So let's use that micro analogy to a country and say, we have every right to expect some sort of regulation or guidance or we are not happy with the direction that this technology is taking our kids ourselves in then we need to implement some sort of change i am sure that we could just let this conversation run but i'm going to jump in and shift us a little bit just because uh, the way the build up to this was structured was we kind of did opportunities and barriers but we had two other uh, dimensions uh, to what we explored on the way to this conversation. And one of them was uh, areas for further exploration. And I think, uh, you know, it's going to fit nicely. You'll be able to continue your the conversation that I think is already uh, going and, and very rich. Uh, but the, the three uh, areas for further explanation exploration that came up was how do we increase uh, public confidence in digital governance? Uh, what are the, what's the potential for artificial intelligence or machine learning? And uh, how can the digital uh, transition enable direct democracy? So given those three and where we are at in the conversation so far, I think Amanda, I saw your hand up, but uh, can you make the link? And even if you can, pick up wherever you like. <laughs> Sure. I was actually just like cheersing um, Shingai on the comment that we shouldn't be afraid to regulate tech firms. And I think we really need to reorient ourselves to remember that like, that's what governments are for. They they regulate the rules around my house. And that's why I don't worry about my roof falling in on me. And I don't know why I wouldn't expect the same in the digital environment. So um, I'm clearly a pro-state person. And I, I really genuinely believe that we, we should open up more conversations about regulating technology firms, but, uh, and technologies writ large. All that to say, um, your, your point about sort of, um, the question was like directions moving forward, basically. Um, yeah, would it... yeah. Um, and I think the point of confidence, confidence in digital government is such an important topic. And I, I, I think this is like what I was trying to get at initially and in saying, you know, we need to think about grounding our view of digital government in a, in a kind of democratic, through a democratic process, because um, I, I think there's lots of, what I really fear is that we move really fast down some path to introduce new innovations, new ways of sharing data, 
new models for service delivery, um, new applications of AI to, you know, decision making and government, um, all in the name of like, we need to meet the citizen expectation. If we don't, we're going to look slow or like we're going to miss opportunities to save money or be more efficient or whatever, all, all of which I appreciate are deeply important things for governments to be thinking about um, giving limited resources and unlimited demands on them. But I worry that we go so fast that we and we don't first check in to get the social license for these new ways of operating. And then you, you know, it's not like when a tech firm makes a mistake or their app fails or whatever, and like they lose market share or or their stakeholder their shareholders are disgruntled or they fail. Um, you break the social contract if government takes steps that is seen to be out of line with where the public's comfort level is. And we need to do a lot more work to understand what that comfort level is. And I think some of a lot of the public opinion research that gets cited and marshaled in support of digital innovations is, is really quite weak. Um, if you actually probe the questions that are being asked, they're very simplistic. They don't ask people to think me about meaningful trade-offs between, say, speed and ease of access and liberal use of data, let's say. They don't break down often by race. And I think this is such an important question because your view of what's okay for the state to do with your data or for how they could use AI, let's say, to make decisions about your eligibility to cross a border or access a benefit are very, very shaped by your experience of the state based on your your the color of your skin and how people view you, you know? And I think um, if you were to take some of these surveys, which show Canadians really want their governments to look more like the private sector, or Canadians are very comfortable with AI, and you broke it down by race, I think you'd see a very different story. Um, there's some research coming out of McMaster looking at um, pri view, uh, privacy, views of privacy in the smart city, which didn't have a strong enough data set to produce statistical, statistically robust findings, but is getting at least hinted at the suggestion that very much so amongst the Canadian population, racialized and Indigenous populations are not as comfortable with how their data is being used by the state as white populations. So more um, focus on those differentials, I think, would be really helpful. And then uh, I'd also like to see us um, kind of uh, taking these public opinion data and then doing maybe some, some more kind of qualitative engagement and consultation with Canadians around this what you would get is hopefully a strong enough evidence base to know what the no-go zones are and to know where maybe there actually is a lot of room to innovate and we're currently hampered by an assumption that Canadians wouldn't let us do those things. And that, that's a sweet spot to play in because you're earning the social license to innovate as opposed to what I see now, which is this panicked narrative of if we don't innovate, we're going to lose trust. When ironically, you might be losing the trust or breaking that social contrast by moving far too quickly. Thank you. Um, Greg, would you like to uh, pick up and comment on? Yeah, I, I think Amanda makes a series of, of, of excellent points and, and I, I, don't want to, I don't want to diminish uh, any of the points that she brings up at all. And, and history is littered with folks who've innovated themselves out of the sweet spot and have, have, have passed on to, you know, to, to obsolescence. So, so you certainly that's the that's the real challenge and that's the real uh, 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 you know ça c'est le défi nous. Um, so I, I I think that's a that, that those are important points also the important points of uh, asking you know you know disaggregating the data uh, I think it's also important that's a fancier way of, of, of talking about what Amanda said by breaking down uh, you know any any public research uh, polling that we do uh, to making sure that you are uh, meeting the needs because everybody comes with their own uh, worldview and it changes uh, the more you expand out I mean uh, you know 40 years ago people didn't take women's points of view uh, seriously you know what a mistake on a pol public policy development that was. Uh, we don't wish to repeat that with folks of of, of, of different uh, um, backgrounds, uh, different racial uh, uh, components, uh, different intersectionalities. Um, so we have, you know, if we really want resilient uh, policy development, uh, you would want to make sure that you always ask yourself the question: Who's around the table that's making the decisions? Who's not here? Um, and you know, it should we make sure that there are people here from those uh, uh, from those uh, groups? So uh, I think she's all correct on all of that. Nonetheless, there is the the threat that 
and I don't think Amanda wants me to, is trying to diminish this threat, but there is a threat that we could be left behind because we didn't innovate into the sweet spot that Canadians are expecting. So as much as we can innovate ourselves out of it, sometimes through inaction, that sweet spot moves. And um, that could be a real issue. So uh, there, you know, that it's, I don't, we shouldn't d diminish that real public policy fear uh, that um, the state could be delegitimized by not moving to where people expect them to be. Um, uh, that being said, I, 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 I'm totally uh, into making sure that the citizen rests at the center in the terms of our data development and then how we harvest and, and, and how it gets harvested outside of government. And that's the reason why governments exist to set the, that framework in which um, you know, the, the economy would function, in, in, in which the economy would function. Uh, so, so let's, let's, you know, get busy because for, you know, for the last 15 years, um, we just haven't put it in the framework in place uh, that would be necessary, that should be necessary. Thank you. Uh, we have a steady stream of questions and comments <laughs> coming in. Uh, I'm going to go back to the session we had before uh, and just pick up on the wild ideas, because I think it would be nice to touch on all those areas. That was the result of, you know, reflecting on the minister's remarks, having breakout groups, you know, brainstorming and ranking some ideas. So I think we'll just feed that in for one last uh, round of comment and then uh, we obviously should have scheduled two hours for this because uh, it's very rich. Uh, the first one, I don't think we have to comment about it for a long time because it was to embrace the COVID-19 innovations. And I think we've touched on that around opportunities. It's come up a couple of times. But the other two, what's the world beyond GDP economic thinking? We need to move to a more inclusive community capital, social, cultural, physical, economic, human dimension of how we measure our society. And the other one was implement a com campaign where we identify digital ambassadors to represent the voice of the user. And the suggestion beyond that was to engage new grads, exclamation mark. So there's probably a few of those uh, <laughs> in the conversation here. Uh, can I perhaps go to Anita and then Shanghai, and then we'll loop back to uh, Amanda and Greg. Does that sound okay? Yeah, certainly. I actually really like this conversation about, uh, you know, the next level of uh, professionals in our in our in our country, right? Both, uh, you know, immigrants and and those that are here. I mean, you know, at some point or the other, we're still a very new society. So, you know, most of our backgrounds do come from outside of Canada in some nature or the other. I, you know, my parents came here in the 60s and a and, you know, very different life we live now. I would say, uh, you know, the engaging the fresh opinions of students, doesn't matter if they're high school, university, or, or any capacity colleges, is probably actually going to help us, you know, with our way forward. It, 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 they only think of innovation, but then at the same time, they, they balance that with, you know, this gig economy and and we need to live a free, more free society. And there is no, the, the biases are far less than they, than they ever have been before. I know I'm personally thankful for that. I think everyone is thankful for that. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, this concept of public opinion seems to be resonating and through this dialogue, it just, it keeps popping in my head every time everyone's speaking. And so, uh, and and leveraging the insights of the, the the next generation, I think is critical. I know the prime minister did that a few times uh, to get opinions as well, and and it was very much applauded, right? Uh, when you think about um, how we're looking at the world really differently. So I don't have more than that to say. I just think that uh, you know, in all aspects, in every industry, not just federal public sector and provincial governments, but even across different industries, that's becoming the new way forward. And even giving them the opportunity to innovate on uh, everyone's nickel, right? So that we can actually think of things differently, which can then inform new ways of working. So thanks, Peter. Thank you, Anita. And uh, so we'll go around. I'm hoping like we're gonna be four o'clock 
flaps a little bit. So I'm gonna, but I'm gonna give you each kind of a minute of closing remarks after this round. So if you can just take like two minutes each, we should be able to close close to on time. <laughs> Go ahead. Sure. So I actually, I, I do a lot of work with young people and I think it's absolutely fantastic that we include them in the conversation. The caveat that I would put though is that they have to be empowered and educated themselves. So we have created uh, a world where everybody has um, a, a, a microphone and they can you know, say whatever they want into the world. And um, many young people do make use of the various microphones that we have uh, afforded them. Uh, but that said, and I mark papers on, uh, you know, I teach a data science program through Wood Green Community Services. So quite recent, as recently as last week, I was marking papers on um, AI bias from uh, sort of 16, 15, 16 year olds. And I want to push substance. So it's not enough for them to have an opinion about it that's, you know, oh, it, it, everybody should be included and, you know, Black people shouldn't be disadvantaged because computer vision models struggle with our skin tone. That's not enough for me. They actually need to know and understand the components of how does a model like that come to pass, as well as the benefits like uh, we have the COVID-19 pandemic has been far less uh, uh, terrible than it could have been because of tools like um, artificial intelligence, neural network models being used to uh, in diagnoses and in treatment options, etc. So that's the, my one caveat is I think it's a brilliant idea to include young people, but at the same, same time, let's not give them that false sense of you know, giving them power and a, a microphone and a platform when they don't necessarily, when they aren't necessarily equipped to talk about the kinds of uh, themes and topics that we're discussing here. And um, in the same vein of saying, sorry, my two minutes almost up, in the same vein of having, uh, thinking of who our next prime minister is going to be, that education component keeps coming back. And I know the world is moving to various educational formats. You know, some people are doing away with degrees. Um, those are separate conversations we can have, but whoever is in charge, whoever we're giving that microphone and that platform needs to have a solid understanding of um, all the different you know, aspects, the benefits, the issues, uh, privacy, etc. So that's my caveat. Super. Thank you. Amanda. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I think an inclusive conversation should definitely emphasize the, the perspective of youth. I think that's pretty un uncontroversial for sure. Um, and I think maybe in thinking about the education piece around sort of like bringing more tech literacy into schools, we should also couple that with a strengthened focus on civics and kind of an understanding of our political institutions. I think that can be a fairly impoverished scene in um, in many schools today. And, and I part of this is that I feel bad because the, the plates of teachers keep getting bigger and bigger. And I find I'm constantly turning to the education system as a solution for what are like very systemic and large problems. But um, it's this captive audience. I think that's why we, we look to schools and education. Um, so yes, engage young people for sure. Um, provide education on digital and tech, but let's also think about producing a, a you know the next generation of really robust digital era citizens who are engaged in their politics um, as a pathway to then engaging in these conversations about technology. Great. So I'm going to go to Greg, and then I'm going to go one last round, kind of you know a minute or each, just to make a closing comment, uh, and we'll just keep going in the same order. Anita. Shanghai, Amanda, Greg, you'll get the last word. But right now you get to pick up the conversation where we're at. <laughs> right on. Well, I, again, I, I, I think Shanghai, Anita, and Amanda have, have really brought up some excellent points. Uh, maybe I would I'd reframe it a little bit. You know, I think the, the generation which is coming in, it's not that they, um, uh, they're, they're forcing us to, they, they have different biases than we have. Um, and I think this is the hard thing I'm discovering as, as growing older is this understanding that, you know, what you know, the sort of that incomprehensibility I had of older generations when I was 25, now they have of me. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's, it's quite humbling. Uh, but I, I think this is something that we also have to pay attention to. And it's not only uh, government, it's not only the private sector that's being transformed by the, this new digital era, uh, as, as Stephen Van Dyne put in the chat, I think, you know, I think education system. And I say that as somebody who used to work for Canada's universities before I became a politician. Um, I, you know, this is, uh, you know, it, it's going to, this is going to have an effect everywhere. And, and I think the generation that's coming up, they just have a different 
relationship with um, with 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 data, with notions of privacy uh, that that I would sometimes disagree with profoundly. Um, but it will be their world, right? So um, how do we how do we try to impart to them some of the issues which we think uh, are, are important uh, on on the ethical side, as as, as Shingai brought up, uh, and how we uh, deal with data, or is it maybe not relevant to them? Um, maybe they have a completely different focus, and and do they understand the implications of that and the effect that that could have on government as an organization of people of of the people? Um, you know, are, do do they understand the full implications of what that could mean? Um, and hopefully, they do care about it. But that that will require some form of education and popular education that we can have more than just a formal one, in in which those who who go on to uh, post secondary education. Super, thank you. So uh, just. It's uh, four o'clock now, but if you're all bear with us and we kind of do one minute each at about 4.05, we should be able to wrap this up. So uh, just a closing comment, Anita. Hopefully you've been watching the chat. It's been brilliant. Uh, go ahead. Just reading it. My goodness. Mm -hmm. I, I think that, like, I'm just going to go with what uh, Catherine just wrote here because it's really compelling. I think at the end of the day, we are all corporate citizens. I'm going to use corporate citizens. I really like that term. And we all move around in our careers, right? I was both in public and private sector, uh, you know, education, politicians, we are all corporate citizens at, at the core. And I think uh, Greg said it as well, uh, even though I'm uncomfortable saying Greg, but I'm gonna say it. Uh, but, but uh, you know, I, I think that uh, that's probably at the center of where our thinking has to be, right? You know, one day you're this role, one day you're that role, you're trying to feed your family. I don't know. You got a cool job. You're it, that doesn't really matter if you can center yourself, especially as you get older. And I understand what it means, like getting older. Center yourself around, you know, what do, what are you doing that's purposeful that matters as a corporate citizen? If you keep that in the center of your thinking, and as leaders, we we go arm in arm around thinking about how to solve the problems that matter to us most as a society, thinking about everyone and being inclusive. You know, let let's just take that as the angle um, and find those who think the same way and have those drive the agenda. And I, I'm just going to kind of leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, sure. So I'll, I will summarize my thoughts into three words, security, skills, and sensitivity. So security, we are privileged to be in this great country and it's something that we need to protect. So um, we've been talking about digital. Uh, one of the biggest challenges is about the security around digital and it's it's about protecting citizens. It's about protecting at a national level. Um, so I would say that's one of the things that needs to be firmly first on the agenda. Once we've done that, I'd say the next step is skills and that's the education conversation that we've been having here. And it's across the board from high school all the way to policymakers and the citizens that are going to be using uh, the, the digital services. And then finally, it's sensitivity, which I think Anita is alluding to, which is there's got to be empathy around this topic that we're all coming at it differently. We're coming from different education systems, uh, education faculties, and verticals. Uh, so there's definitely something to be said about uh, empathy and making sure that everyone is coming along with us, uh, because there's no point in waking up to a fantastically digital Canada one day and we've left people behind. Thank you. Amanda? Thanks. I mean, I think one, one thing I want to say is um, I think we need more of these conversations. And I, I really enjoyed this, um, you know, discussion and debate and, and having the opportunity to, to bring together different sectors and also um, to have engagement with with political leaders, I think is so important. So thanks to the IOG for convening this and thanks to all the other panelists and participants for for taking part in this. Um, I think going forward, I'd probably make an appeal in this, I think, I mean, there's this, like, we're at a really big opportunity point right now, post COVID, digital is very much on the agenda. And I think this could go very well, it could also go very poorly. So one of the things I think we should try to focus on and ensuring it goes really well is to be ambitious, but also to be small, um, focus on um, small projects that are ambitious. Um, that's what I, I mean to say, not 
multi-billion dollar, multi-year, massive digital transformation strategies, these tend to fail at a remarkable rate. Um, so echoing the, the the, the kind of philosophy that the minister included in her remarks, I think she said all the right things about modular and open and platforms and engagement. Um, but let's not um, think that the post COVID world needs to be um, rapid transformation right away, as opposed to kind of um, learning from smaller projects and building, building from there. I think that there's still, this is still a space that very much needs that right now. Super. Thank you. Greg, you get the last word on this panel today. And I feel terrible for this. So um, <laughs> I'm going to take full advantage of it nonetheless. <laughs> That's the way the cookie crumble. Um, uh, Anita, I have to admit, I'm, I'm, I'm reluctant. I'm resistant uh, to adding a qualification to the word citizen. citizen. Uh, so corporate citizen concerns me. I, I, I think fundamentally we are citizens and we need to apply our citizen model in all aspects of what we do, uh, whether that's in the private sector, whether that's in education, whether that's in community development. So I, I, or, or in the whole notion of, of data and the whole notion of, of digital transformation. I really do think we have to have that citizen uh, model. And I, I think that's the model that the minister has, has laid out and, and one which I can subscribe because fundamentally, despite all the cyber personalities that we may have or the anonymity that it gives us, there is there should be a person behind all of that. Um, and that person has to be seen as in the full complexity of, of, of of that person, of personhood. Uh, so I, I think that's that's the approach that we need to take. And you can use that approach in many different models, in many different sectors. Um, I, I, did, I really did like uh, what Shingai talked about in terms of security skills and sensitivity. I think that that really does capture um, uh, and also an important approach uh, which to take. Um, and uh, I, I, I do applaud Amanda again uh, for, you know, for the concerns that she's raising and making sure that we have um, the right uh, to make an informed decision as to where we're, where we're choosing to go. Uh, and that uh, is usually the result of, of education. So I think, uh, I think we all have uh, raised some really good points on it, but fundamentally, uh, we're all looking for some way to ensure that we, we're not looking to put the genie back in a bottle, but I think we just want to make sure that, the, you know, the genie is just not going off in all sorts of directions and somehow we have to frame it uh, and make sure that people at the, at the end have a say in terms of how it's exploited and how it's being used. So there you go. Good luck. That's good luck, everybody. We're, we're into this brave new world and such wonderful, wondrous things in it. Eh? Yes. Thank you all. What a wonderful panel. I echo the comments uh, that have come up in the chat. Fantastic panel. panel. Thank you. Thank you so much to the four panelists. Uh, it, it was just a, a brilliant afternoon. And I really, really appreciate you joining us. And I, I like that metaphor of a genie. Maybe we'll maybe we'll pick up on that one for our uh, for our, the next time we uh, kick off a, a big discussion like this. Uh, one more quick shout out I'd like to do, and that's just to Ryan Androsoff. Uh, he had kind of conceived this afternoon and conceived and and arranged some of the invitations to panelists and to the minister's office, and uh, it's just been uh, my honor to be able to uh, moderate uh, with such great participation from the four of you the minister earlier and all of the participants here today. With that, we thank you again. And I'm gonna turn it over to our president. You're welcome to stick around for his closing remarks. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much, Peter. Um, and I have to say, thank God, I don't have to just wrap up on this panel because uh, the superlatives would be pretty hard to follow. I need to wrap up though, I think on the whole day. And I need to thank every speaker, every panelist, and every participant who registered for this program, who got engaged and contributed to it. And I have to thank everyone at the IOG who made this happen. And there are far too many of you to mention, though I'm going to give a shout out to Becky Holland, who's our event maestro. Uh, for me, this is the beginning of a conversation about a blueprint for an inclusive, digitally enabled government and what it might look like. 
this morning we were looking, if you like, in that sort of policy domain, uh, where we were looking at the issues around disinformation, misinformation. And of course, this afternoon in this, if you like, call it the management domain, the a question of how do we move toward a digitally enabled government. You can review everything uh, from today on our uh, YouTube channel, and we will be reaching out to you to continue the conversation. This event is part of a larger exploration we're calling CanGov Better. Uh, our view is that governments are facing a changed environment that includes major shifts in citizen expectations, increased flexibility of the workforce, reconciliation, role of government, use of technology, delivery of healthcare, on and on. And digital erections is one of our first, is our first line of inquiry. We want to look at some others, including the role and impact of civil society, the evolving nature of multi-jurisdictional governance, and the modernization of the public service. So once again, I just want to say thank you to everyone. It's been a great day um, beyond, I think, anyone in our organization's ex expectations. We will be in touch. And again, thank you. Great stuff. Hey, Toby, if we have a moment, perhaps we could uh, encourage everyone to give us a little bit of feedback with my poll, if they'd like. Is there a poll? Yes. Ah. Oh. More real-time uh, data collection. There you All right. Oh, real-time data collection. Clear it up. There it is on Slido, everybody. Click on it in the chat. If you have a minute, give us give us your views.